everybody. Welcome back to another reaction stream. My name is Todd. It is Thursday. Hope you're doing well. It is technically the Friday of the week for the channel uh, because on actual Friday, I'm usually offline recording the longer form content for the website as well as I have a couple videos here from High School Musical that I think are going to get absolutely blocked on YouTube. So I'm going to record those separately <laughs> and uh, you know do my best to obstruct it and then I'll upload the unedited on the website for the members to watch. The website is toddreacts.com if you're interested. And uh, we got merch available as well. This is the sweatshirt for the winter collection. We have a heavyweight hoodie, beanie, denim jacket, sweatpants, long sleeve tee, whole bunch of stuff. I think you'll be surprised. There's a lot of items on there in an array of colors to fit your style. Go ahead and check it out. Members get a 15% discount on every order. Um, YouTube channel members get a 5% discount on every order. And uh, yeah, welcome back. Hope, you, uh, hope you've hope you been enjoying the streams. It's been interesting. It's been a learning curve a little bit. Um, I'm so used to editing everything I say that it's just kind of odd to not do that <laughs> anymore. But it's also saving me a ton of time, which is great. So I can actually, I don't know, think about the future of the channel, come up with new things interesting things, how to, you know, expand content, whatever. It's been really great, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Today we have five videos, Gilmore Girls, Sprina, Grey's Anatomy, General Hospital, and Leverage. Pretty good mix. Hope you enjoy it. Um, if you have any feedback for these streams, certainly let me know down below in the comments. I appreciate any and all feedback, uh, as you're the ones consuming the content, so... It makes sense that I would appreciate your feedback. <laughs> I watched Red Dawn recently, just to start things off. I watched Red Dawn recently, uh, the remake, the 2012 remake, I think, with uh, Chris Hemsworth and Josh Hutcherson, I think is his name, the guy in um, Hunger Games. <laughs> I forget his name. It's like Petra or something. Peter Petra, something like that. Um Hey, welcome, Morgan. Finally made a stream on time, <laughs> either halfway through or when you're... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you made it. Good job. Happy to have you here. Um, but yeah, what was interesting about this remake is it was actually pretty good. I've seen the original Red Dawn. Uh, it was great. It was a classic. I think Emilio Estevez was in that. I'm not for sure who was in that movie, but I, it was a really good movie. And I saw the remake recently. Um for the second time, so I'm going back to it again. It's kind of interesting. They changed the enemy of the movie a little bit, so instead of it, the Russian army invading, if you don't know what Red Dawn is, basically a foreign enemy basically lands and tries to take over the U.S. <laughs> That's basically the gist of it. And a bunch of high school, high schoolers, football players, whatever, join this um, band, this group, that tries to fight back. Guerrilla warfare kind of stuff. And um, in the original, it was the Russian army invading. But in the remake, it was the uh, North Korean army invading. But halfway through, you learn that they're being sponsored by the Russian army. Which I guess makes a little more sense. You kind of... The Russian army saw the potential for it going sideways and probably was just like, you know what? Let's have the North Korean army go first, <laughs> try to soften them up a little bit, and then maybe we'll, you know, do it ourselves. So it kind of makes a little bit more strategic sense in that way, which kind of makes it more believable. Um, at first, it there was no mention of a sponsor at all. So you're just like, this is kind of goofy. <laughs> like, this isn't going to work. Uh, and then you learn that the Russian army was actually sponsoring it, and you're like, oh, okay, I get it. I get it. That's how they're getting funding and all that stuff and, you know, arms and whatnot. It made a little bit more sense. But in the beginning, it's just so unbelievable that it's hilarious. <laughs> but it was a really good movie. Uh, Chris Hemsworth is in it. He, he played a really good uh, brother with, oh, gosh, I don't even know his name. I don't know his name. But the two brothers in the movie are fantastic together. Chris Hemsworth is one of them. Really great cast. It was good. I highly recommend it. If you haven't seen the original, well, yeah, you can see the remake because 
it's literally a remake. It doesn't advance the story at all. <laughs> you can literally just go in cold to it. But uh, I would definitely recommend the 2012 version if you haven't seen it. So the first video is... Let's see. It is Gilmore Girls. Emily and Lorelai Mirror Ball is the title of it. I have no idea what that is. Maybe it's the name of the song. I'm assuming it's the name of the song. That's usually how this goes. And afterwards, honestly, I'm going to look a little bit more into Emily, because I don't think I've really deep dove into that at all. So let's go ahead and jump in. Subscribe to the channel, the YouTube channel. Follow the Twitch channel if you want to watch live. Uh, eventually, this will be live on YouTube, so, you know, do what you will. <laughs> Do I look shorter? Because I feel shorter. Why can't we have what you and Rory have? Uh, Rory and I are different, Mom. We're mother and daughter. You're mother and daughter. It shouldn't be that different. It's completely different. It couldn't be more different. But why? Lorelai, come back to the table. Is this what it's going to be like every Friday night? I come over and let the two of you attack me? You're being very dramatic. Very talented man, your father. She knows. He always was a smart one, that boy. You must take after him. Why would he bring up Christopher? Was that really necessary? He likes Christopher. Isn't that interesting? Because as I remember, when Christopher got me pregnant, Dad didn't like him so much. I get it. I'm horrible. So why don't you disown me and adopt Christopher? You love him. Don't be a martyr, Lorelei. Don't be naive. Do you think I love the boy who got my daughter pregnant? I wanted to kill him. I would have, too, with my bare hands. <laughs> but there was a proper procedure to be followed in a situation like this. Marriage. Christopher was willing to follow the procedure we laid out. You weren't. Uh, well, please. You were we laid out. But we were supposed to throw you a party. Ooh. We were disappointed. Don't such a bright future. Yes, and by not getting married, we got to keep those bright futures. What about what I wanted? Dad, didn't that matter to you at all? Just you wanted to control me. You were still a child. Oh, so I'm a villain now, is that it? I spent a fortune on this party. I spent days planning it, making sure that every little detail was perfect. The food, the linen, the music. And I did all this for Rory. Well, that's not what she needed, Mom. What she needs is for you to accept her apology and come to her party. That's what she needs. But you don't care what she needs. How dare you? You don't even know what she needs because you don't know her. You never tried to know her, just like you never knew me. Oh, I know you. Oh, please, you don't know anything about me. <laughs> no, this is where we used to live. What? Right when Mom and I moved here, this was our apartment. See, we had our bed right over there, and Mom put up this really pretty curtain around the tub so that it looked like a real bathroom. Grandma? No? Can I help you? No, thank you. I just... <laughs> that realization that you screwed up. I just wanted to meet the woman who help raise my daughter. What's this? Well, that's me, Mom. I know it's you. You're wearing a cast. Oh, that's when I broke my leg. You broke your leg? Yeah, three years ago during a yoga class. <laughs> that must have been some extreme yoga. Emily? She's right. I don't know my daughter at all. Is that everything that happened in the past is suddenly fine because I defended you? No. That the hell that you put your mother and me through for the past 16 years has suddenly washed away? Well, it's not. We've all been through hell, Dad. I had to tell my friends, my colleagues, that my only daughter, the brightest in her class, was pregnant and was leaving school. That must have been devastating. And then you run away and you treat us as lepers. Your mother couldn't get out of bed for a month. Did you know that? Did you? No. We did nothing to deserve that. Nothing to earn that. Boy, that is... I don't even know how to... Ah, gosh. That is such a weird mix, because it's like, yeah, you cared about the opinion of others a lot, and clearly you took that very hard, but you also were not very understanding <laughs> about the situation. You tried to micromanage it away. But then she ran away, and then you felt hurt. And it's just like, golly. Both, you're trying to have it both ways. <laughs> Sometimes home is where your heart is. Or where your family is. Yes, that too.
When Laura and I showed up on my porch that day with a tiny baby in her arms, I thought to myself, what if this were my daughter? And she was cold and scared and needed a place to live. What would I want for her? And then I thought I'd want her to find somebody to take her in and make her safe and help her find her way. That's funny. I would have wanted her to find someone who would send her home. <laughs> well, maybe she realized home was not much of a home. A mutual mistake, Richard. This whole evening is ridiculous. We're supposed to sit here like one big happy family and pretend that the damage that was done is over, gone? I don't care about how good a student you say that girl is. Hey. Our son was bound for Princeton. Every Hayden male attended Princeton, including myself, but it all stopped with Christopher. It's a humiliation we've had to live with every day, all because you seduced him into ruining his life. She had that baby, mm. and she ended his future. Isn't this interesting? Oh my God. You're afraid. Life happens, buddy. What? Good grief. That Rory will enjoy the club and have a good time without you. We have to celebrate. Next week we will have a special dinner. Grandma, all of your dinners are special. Well, this one will be extra special. We'll make all your favorite foods. Why don't you care? Why have you never cared? No matter what has happened to me my entire life, you've never been happy for me, and that hurts. Mom, it really hurts. I'm not discussing this with you. Do you know how it felt for me to tell you that I was getting married and to have you just brush it off like that? Do you know? No, I don't. I don't know. Possibly very similar to finding out from a complete stranger that my only daughter was getting married and had told every other person in the world before she bothered to tell her own mother. Possibly it felt something like that. Lori and I are best friends, Mom. We are best friends first and mother and daughter second. And you and I are mother and daughter always. I wasn't taught to be best friends with my daughter. I was taught to be a role model for my daughter. That too. Explains I did what a I lot. Was right. I did what I thought I had to do to protect you. And be but then again, you don't want to be best friends first. You want to be mother daughter first, but best friends second, like one A, one B. So you at least have that ability to discipline, and you have an authority over them. They listen to you. You know, you have a you have a word on how they act, how what they do. But you're also understanding because you're also, you know, you were young once. You had, you know, a parent that, you know, you interacted with. So you understand a lot. It's got to be a balance. Because of this, we have no relationship. Oh, we have a relationship. Otherwise, you're all authority we do. and what? What is our not relatable. Well, we... Exactly. <laughs> Link down in the YouTube description for the original edit. Go throw it some love. It was very good. Very, very good. It's it's definitely a double-edged sword because you got to... You got to have the authority, but you also don't want to be so unrelatable to the point where it you're just judge, jury, and executioner, and that's it. Because <laughs> it seems a very much like those types of parents are so into their friends and how other people see their family, that they lose all sight of their family. Or maybe they're absorbed in their job, or workaholics or whatever. It's got to be a blend. Got to be a blend. Um, I was watching an interview on YouTube. Uh, this guy was interviewing billionaires, right? And he asked one of the billionaires, you know, what's your greatest achievement in life? And uh, the billionaire said, the fact that my kids still talk to me. Um, I'm 60 years old or 65. I forget what, how old he was, but my parents still talk to me. That is the, or my kids still talk to me. That is the greatest achievement I've ever had. Because if your kids, I know a lot of people that earned a lot of money and their kids d don't want anything to do with them. They'll never talk to them again because they lost sight of the family. And I was just like, Hmm, that, that is a damn good answer. <laughs> Because that is somewhat true in a lot of cases, is that if you're chasing the almighty dollar, uh, you tend to lose track of what your priorities are. And if you're constantly thinking on the job, constantly working, you will neglect something. 
in life. And if it's your own kids, that's that's pretty awful. <laughs> Cuz you kind of screw them up for a while and they're going to have to work through those issues. And I don't Yeah, they'll be, you know, somewhat fixed, but oh gosh, it's really hard to fix that. Cuz your family is supposed to be your biggest supporters, cheerleaders, you know, they're supposed to be there for you during their worst times. And if you mess that up or you don't have that kind of relationship, boy, it can be very lonely, very lonely in the world. So it seems very much like they were like Emily and I have no idea what her husband's name is. Um, were so wrapped up in appearances and how they were taught and they didn't take anything from that. Like, oh, you know, maybe it would have been better to if my parents did this. So I'll do this uh, when I become a parent. I think that's healthy. You got to look at, you know, how you were as a child, your childhood, how your parents acted. Take the good things. Drop the bad things. Husband's name is Richard. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, Take the good things, leave the bad things, and then just kind of come up with some, you know, some of your own parenting techniques. And hopefully it's better than how you were raised. Whether that uh, dawned on Emily or not, I have no idea. It kind of seems like it. So I brought this up because it's interesting. Maturing is realizing that Emily was right the entire time. Interesting concept. Let's go ahead and dive into this. I see this take all over social media. Maybe I'm too sensitive, but I think it's so problematic. So many people think that Lorelai was just unnecessarily mean to Emily. Because Emily supposedly, let's see if I can, there we go, supposedly loves Lorelai and has good intentions. People think Lorelai should just suck it up and be pleasant. I just don't understand how people watch the same show in which Lorelai is constantly berated, called a failure, manipulated, etc. by her own mother and think Lorelai is the problem. People even say that Emily deserves to act that way because she was traumatized by Lorelai leaving. I definitely think that Lorelai can be toxic at times. Well, when you're raised like that, (laughs) some things are going to happen, right? But I don't think she should be blamed for a relationship with Emily. Why do some people have so much empathy for Emily and Richard, but none? There we go. (laughs) Emily and Richard, but none for Lorelai. That is an odd take. That is an odd take. Right the entire time? I probably wouldn't say that. Again, I haven't seen the show, so I don't have the full context. But um, when it comes to a parent and child relationship, that responsibility falls on the parent every time. Every time. You take responsibility for your kids. Um, Now, things can happen. They can get in with like a bad friend crowd or something, or maybe they get into, you know, get mixed in with people that turn them against the parents, that can happen, right? But usually when it's involving younger kids and and parent-kid relationship, it makes sense that it's on the parents. Maturing is realizing Lorelai was protecting herself. That's what it should be. I hate... I hate, too, how people will be like, she crosses her arms and pouts like a child in the room with them, as if Emily isn't berating her and still shaming her for every past mistake. I do think her and Emily, their relationship does get better throughout the series. Emily does realize the damage she caused in some ways, but my God, Lorelai felt she had to go through birth alone. Felt she had to raise her daughter in a shack by herself. There's no way into adulthood she'll magically forgive and forget her childhood. I think that's what I was saying earlier, that you can you can kind of get past a little bit of it, but it'll always kind of be there. This is something that I wish diehard Emily fans would see. Yes, Lorelai chose to do all those things alone, but why did she feel she had to? Um, the fact that at 16 she took a bus to the hospital to deliver her own, on her own, speaks volumes. I don't think people realize how bad it must be if a teenager chooses chooses to go through all of that alone rather than with a parent. Same with, yeah, a shack wasn't ideal, but how bad must it have been that Lorelai felt she had to raise Rory 
that way for eight plus years. Lorelai, we know, wouldn't have done that if there was any other way. Staying in that house would have been terrible for everyone. Well, yeah, it, was, it seems pretty clear that the parents were ashamed, embarrassed, you know, very obvious things. Things you should never make aware to the kid that is going through it. That's crazy. Those are things you should probably just internalize and not outwardly project to the kid. That was definitely a mistake. Um, if you have controlling helicopter parents, which is a lot of parents, by the way, with questionable values that they believe are beyond reproach, then it is common to have a child that grows up and behaves as Lorelai does. Lorelai learned to put herself first. She has an amazing backbone, and she will not be made to bend the knee to her parents. I love that about her. Yeah. Unfortunately, helicopter parenting, I don't know. It's, it's a double-edged sword because you don't want to hover too much over your kids or they'll never, you know, scrape a knee, learn how to pick themselves back up, um, learn how to explore a little bit, you know, learn some important life lessons, picking yourself up, uh, you know, being curious, whatever. But you also don't want to be so hands-off that you're, Richard and Emily, and you're just, <laughs> you're just, you're just those types, not maybe not them specifically, but those types where just like, you know, I think it, um, I think my mom said of her parents' generation that a lot of times it was the parents and their friends hanging out. The kids were to be seen, not heard. And most of the time, right around like dinner time, they'd kick all the kids out of the house so they could have some cocktails and have a little cocktail hour or whatever. And just said, get out of the house. We don't want to see you. <laughs> like, There's definitely levels to this. Excuse me. <clears throat> there's definitely levels to this. But uh, I would say a happy medium is probably the best case. Unfortunately, it's kind of hard to do that. My mom is a lot like Emily. It's hard to build a relationship with a parent who is always playing the victim and acts like a child. Lorelai tried to be nice to Emily, but whenever she did, Emily would still have an attitude. The attitude is wild. It's like constantly being judged. It's very, it's very, um, you know what I was thinking of when I was watching that it was Downton Abbey. <laughs> Just the constant judgment, 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 opinion, opinion, opinion. Like you feel like you can't breathe. Basically, you're just in this public show, even around your parents. You have to be on your best behavior at all times. Meanwhile, it should be, if you're at home, that should like come off. You should be like comfortable, at ease. There should be none of that like, oh, I have to mind my P's and Q's or I'm embarrassing my parents in front of no one. <laughs> I have a mill with Emily-esque tendencies. I don't even know what that is. Mother-in-law. Mother-in-law. That's it. <laughs> with Emily-esque tendencies. So I always have a hard time being sympathetic. Every once in a while, I'm on her side. But a lot of times, I'm not on either side because they're both being petulant. That's a good... That's a word of the day. Petulant. Not even going to unpack Richard here. <laughs> yeah, when I matured... Yeah, when I matured, I became a mother, and that reinforced how deeply selfish and messed up some of Emily's actions are. I cannot imagine belittling my daughter in public. That is, there's no excuse for that. Oh my gosh. If you're a parent, if you're significant other, whatever, does that in public, like that is a red line. Like that is not cool. Um, or ridiculing things that she can't help, like the size of her head, or meddling, that's a weird one, or meddling in her life to the extent that I'm ruining things that make her happy just for my own benefit. I do think it's incredibly sad because she deeply loves Lorelai, but she either can't help her actions or can't see that she's wrong. Um, I'm assuming the fact that she was raised like that, it's just kind of ingrained. It just is what it is. That's kind of that nature versus nurture thing. Um... 
I think there's a lot of imprinting when you're young. <laughs> Hot take, everyone. There's a lot of imprinting when you're young. Um, <laughs> that's the most obvious thing ever. I can't believe I just said that. I think personally, there's a lot of implant implant. <laughs> there's a lot of imprinting when you're young. Um, and she's probably just that way. And it would take her making a conscientious effort to change, to change that. Uh, respect is something that should be mutual, not just conferred on older or more powerful parties. And I'm glad that overall we seem to be moving away from the author authoritarian model of the parent always being right. Oh, that's kind of tricky. That's kind of tricky because parent has to be authoritarian a little, right? You got to have some authority and wield it responsibly. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to drive your kid away and become like Emily and just this harsh, awful, autocratic, terrible person. Um. But yes, you need to be a little bit more gentle with your kids. <laughs> and the kids can be right sometimes, but oftentimes uh, kids are wrong. And you have to be able to be comfortable with that. But yeah, having some authoritarian in, in you is good. Otherwise, you raise a monster with no discipline. <laughs> and then we all have to deal with that monster in real life. Um. It is a it is a fine line, but you got to navigate it the best you can. <laughs> You're not always going to get it right. Sometimes you screw up. But uh I think <clears throat> no parent should be above apologizing to their kid. If you get it wrong. All right. Dang. That was that was deep. That was a deep one. I like that. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that one. Next is Spree. I was reading Spencer and I said Sprina. <laughs> wow, my mind is already like transferring it over to Sprina. Spencer and Trina lock it up. And I think that's the name of the song, if I'm not mistaken. I have no idea. I'm going to take a guess. I'm going to say that's true. <laughs> Curly hair, you're my pretty island girl. Oh my gosh. You're my little lion girl High-headed, ain't afraid to throw it down Keep me on my toes, I gotta focus now Lock it up, throw away the key Wanna light me up, can you do it faithfully? You got me twisting my words All the homies keep saying I'm sprung You got all the features I love okay, um, So for clarity's for sake, that would mean that we that would mean that you and I are together. Yes. Together. You got me feeling all kind of ways. I love your body, I can spot it from a mile away. I was thinking me and you could take a holiday. We getting freaky until I'm on delay, on delay. You know what you do. I've never heard this song before. I'm not who I used to be. It should be. But it fits this perfectly, doesn't it? The <laughs> feeling I can't deny. Why do I even try? You put me in paradise. She made me wanna Lock it up, lock it up Lock it up, mine, oh my Lock it up, lock it up Lock it up, mine, oh my Lock it up, lock it up Lock it up, mine, oh my Lock it up, lock it up Lock it up, mine, oh my Baby, set on your perfect girl Now hold on, you get sentimental Let me show you I can take it <laughs> this song though 
just tell me what you say I really need What's up Rin? Welcome back. Better lock it up and I'm waiting. No more. We're having a good Thursday. What are you thinking about? How oh, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. <laughs> That is beautiful. That is beautiful. <laughs> Link down below in the YouTube description for the full edit. Go check it out. Throw out some love. Stunning. I'm assuming that last scene was the first date. Or like one of the most important dates. Maybe the first date is a couple or something. I have no idea. But uh, if you're wearing a suit and tie, that's, that's a pretty good sign. <laughs> You're not just getting a coffee at that point. Oh my God, could you imagine? <laughs> Although I will say, dates are basically interviews. Dates are basically interviews. It is... It can be very nerve-wracking. Especially if you see the other person and you're instantly like attracted to them. And you're just constantly questioning yourself. <laughs> Like, am I making the right choice here? Are they going to be into me like I'm into them? And then you get that, like, pre-interview jitters. Like, uh. <laughs> Imagine showing up to a coffee date in a suit. <laughs> that would be, that'd be something. That'd be making a statement, wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, at that point, you're basically living in what? The 1950s, 40s, something like that? constantly in a suit i always think back to mad men where you know even on the weekends at home don draper was in like a collared shirt with like a sweater over it and like khakis or something <laughs> i'm like damn even at home he can't be comfortable life was really weird back then <laughs> i don't know maybe that's comfortable it's never been comfortable to me suits are surprisingly comfortable they are surprisingly comfortable because it's really soft wool um, most of the time if it's made out of wool. So you think it's going to be super stiff, stiff and uncomfortable, but it's not. I guess maybe if you starch your shirts or something like that, it would be kind of uncomfortable. But uh, a well-fitted suit is actually kind of comfortable. It feels like you're wearing your pajamas out in public, honestly. Weirdly enough. <laughs> a little inside baseball there. At least to me. You know what's funny? A funny situation that uh, I've actually been in my life. Being so into somebody, and you think they're so into you, that you don't even go through the formalities of a relationship. Like you just kind of go in, and you don't, you forget to do the most, like, standard part of a relationship will you be my girlfriend will you be my boyfriend whatever it's that question or that initial like we're in this we're in it together i guess we're together huh yes yes we're together like getting that confirmation or whatever <laughs> you just kind of breeze right by it and then you look back on it and you go wait when did we do that do we have an anniversary is that like a thing <laughs> uh hmm I don't know. Do we start it from here? <laughs> that was very funny. Just being like, yeah, we're dating. You didn't know that? <laughs> right. <laughs> In my mind, we're already married. So, you know, I, just, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I guess I forgot to verbalize it. Been there, yeah. I think that's pretty common. I think that's more common than, you know than not. Um, obviously, it's important to set like the milestones or whatever, but gosh, sometimes, sometimes you just breeze right by it. You're just so into it and you're just lose track of those sorts of things. The last scene in the uh, Sprina edit was during their New York City weekend trip where they had sex for the first time. Spencer wanted to make the trip special for Trina since it was going to be here for, oh, oh. All right. All right. Boy, 
Boy, he went all out for that. <laughs> He's got the suit on. That is a gorgeous, uh, happy fun time, yes. That adult happy fun time. I completely forgot that. <laughs> I'm supposed to be censoring myself. Um. Yes, wow. Yeah, that's a beautiful dinner location, too. I got it literally pulled up in front of me. I'm like, dang, they got greenery. They got the skyline. Perfect lighting. I think there's a candle involved, maybe. <laughs> the best date I ever went on was uh, extremely expensive. Whew. Still recovering. <laughs> it, was, um, it was a steakhouse in uh, Tampa, Florida. Stunning. Stunning. Um, we were given different wines to try so we could pick the one we wanted. Like, it was unbelievable. And the waitress had worked there for 30 years. 30 years. That is completely unheard of. I've never heard of a waitress working at a, the same restaurant for 30 years. <laughs> Other than, like, a diner, maybe, or something. Hey, what's up, Luke? Hope you're doing well. Yeah, it was it was really nice. I had I didn't have a tie on. Okay, I didn't have a tie on. Ties to me are just uh, it's very funeral, wedding, like really important interview. I don't even believe in ties for most interviews unless it's like super important. Like you're downtown in like a city. And you really got to impress. Or maybe you're applying for like a big wig role. You know, you're in the C-suite. You're close to the C-suite. Something like that. The best dad I had was when I was younger. We went to the movies and Dave and Buster's. But it was a full day of laughing and smiles. Loved it. That's awesome. That's great that you had both. Because in the movies, obviously, it's a terrible first date. Because you can't really communicate as the movie's going on. But the fact that you went to Dave and Buster's as well, so you can actually talk to each other, that's that's perfect. That is perfect. That is really nice, actually. And it, it's simple, you know? You get to have fun. You play some games. You eat some food. You also get to see a movie together. You get to talk about the movie. You know, you can learn more about what movies they like. Um, yeah, that is that is a nice, simple date. How long did that last? Was that like an all day kind of thing? Or was that just a uh, nighttime like movie, Dave and Buster's done? Yeah, I love the simple things. Being fancy and uptight doesn't work with me. <laughs> There's very different people out there. Sometimes you meet some people, especially on social media, but I think most people are just BSing on there and they'll just say anything for clicks and views. But uh, yeah, simple things are good. Very good. I like, I like, okay. I like the simple things like museums, um, food, like dinners, um, maybe going to see a movie. What else? You, you'd be kind of interesting as like a little road trip, not as a first date. That is like serial killer vibes. Like that's not good, but maybe a couple dates in take like a road trip. We went out at 1, got home at 10. That's awesome. That is very cool. I mean, that is... What more do you need? <laughs> that is a long time to talk to somebody. And if you're still into it after all that time, I think you're pretty good. My best date was bowling and dinner. Nice. Activities, then dinner is a classic. Or walking along the river and watching a sunset. I live in London. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, bowling is great because you're doing an activity together. Little competition, you know, little competition isn't bad, but you're also talking throughout, which is great. Yeah, activities, then dinner, or dinner, then activities, that is perfect. Now, if you're just like brand new to the person, you have no idea what they're about, maybe the coffee date kind of makes sense. Um, so you can kind of get those proper introductions out of the way. But yeah, that's that's solid. That's solid. My first uh the best first date I had was probably 
Yeah, it was definitely a uh, barbecue place. <laughs> went out to dinner. Went out to dinner. Uh, and then went bar hopping afterwards. That was pretty sweet. That was amazing, actually. <laughs> I felt bad after Dave and Buster's because it was I was so competitive. <laughs> But he's still with me, so I did... Hey, all right. That's a good story. That's happy. I like that. Yeah. Hey, a little competitiveness can be actually really attractive, so that's not that bad. You got to have a little little edge to it, you know? <laughs> I went on a date to, uh, to a Dave & Buster's-like establishment. Uh, it's like a local version of it. And there's this axe throwing competition. I could not get the freaking axe to stay for the life of me. Meanwhile, she's just just getting it bullseye, bullseye, bullseye. I'm like, what the heck is happening here? <laughs> At that point, I was feeling a little salty, but uh, it's all right. <laughs> but we also did bowling because they have a bowling alley in there too. I redeemed myself. I'll say that. So I was I was fine. <laughs> We did bowling because we already knew each other, uh, because we were in the same acting class. Oh, okay, nice. But yeah, if I didn't know them, I would have just had dinner instead as an introduction kind of date. Yeah, that makes sense. That definitely makes sense. Kind of build up to the bowling. <laughs> or maybe just do the bowling and not the dinner or something. It is a fine line, isn't it? And then you have that awkward, like, when do I... When do I tell him I enjoyed it? When do I, you know, contact him again? When do we go out again? You know? Oh, gosh. The amount of times I see in movies and, like, TV shows, like, the three-day rule. And I'm just like, is there a rule? Or is it just, you know, just do what you want? <laughs> if they're that into you, too, they should be okay with you contacting them the day after, right? I don't know about these rules. I love how we've gone on a date tangent. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Completely sidetracked. <laughs> it's interesting, you know? We get to uh, share our stories. <laughs> and, you know, hey, if it worked for somebody, it might work for the next person. My favorite parts of the streams, yeah. <laughs> I do go on some tangents sometimes. <laughs> I don't think there's a rule. It's kind of an expectation from society. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Maybe I just don't maybe I just don't think in that way or something. I just I completely reject any sort of expectations. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I contacted like immediately after too. <laughs> just completely threw that to the wind. Like, hey, I had a really good time. <laughs> I always say when I've had a good time, I just like the reassurance of it all. Yeah, yeah, reassurance is good. Kind of reiterate the fact that you're into them, and hopefully they return the favor and show that they're still interested in you after spending time with you. Everyone's different, I guess, but yeah, I'm like, you threw... <laughs> I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I threw the rule book out. Yeah, absolutely. When you're really into somebody, and like it's not like a mild infatuation or interest it's like wow i want to be with this person just throw that expectation right out <laughs> you can come on too strong and that might scare some people away but you know what if it scares them away so be it so be it All right, video three. I had to look this up because I had no idea what show this was referring to. Uh, Jackson and April, Leaving My Love Behind from Grey's Anatomy. I learned that just a couple minutes ago. <laughs> what hurts us is cumulative. It happens over time. I don't know how we... We absorb blow after blow. So far removed. I need this. Don't know where to start. Shock after shock. I also, let me know if my no, audio levels are a little weird. 
I never have any idea. I'm just kind of playing it by. I don't even know where she is. You don't know what I've been through this last year. This last year. I. It was. It was hard. I know. You mean you know? You don't know. You never asked. You didn't even ask. You're right. I was. I was gonna ask you for it. Just. I was clear about this. My mind was made up. I knew it was best for me moving forward, no matter how hard. I knew there were things that we couldn't repair. Get this place now. Thank you, thank you. You're still not yourself because your wife isn't here. I'm right here. I am your wife. Why is that? Because you sent her away. And it's not clear for me anymore. When I look at you and I stop thinking. You were my best friend, April. My favorite person. She kind of is the sun, moon, and stars all rolled into one. Especially when she loves you. When she oh, loves you, it's Dang. super hard. And I'm hard. not giving up on us. I won't. I want to fight. So I'll fight for the both of us. And all of that love, it's worth the rest of it. And a baby. Get to this. I didn't picture my marriage ending. What, you just, you just serve me papers? Just like that? Do you have any idea what a slap in the face this is? Oh, dang. How do we make it stop? Do you really want this? Could you tell me, is it all a waste of We just, we have to push and we have to fight. I know, with all of my being, that you need to get over this stubborn ego, stubborn pride. When did you decide that you were done? I'm not sure we are worth fighting for. Oh, wow. Go call and claim the woman oh that you God. love, because you're not going to get over it. You're damn sure never going to get over her. Oh, wow. That was so beautiful for like 75% of that. And then it just went to hell. Oh, no. Link down below in the YouTube description for the original edit. So you can throw it some love. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Well, that was really nice for a little bit. I was so happy for a split second there. Yeah, I believed in love for a split second. <laughs> then it was ripped away. Chills to shock in the matter of seconds. Absolutely. That turn so fast and then it got really savage like you're not worth fighting for or something or we're not worth fighting for I'm like dang Woo. that's a heart ripper just good lord well folks that was um that was pretty ruthless at the end there that's one way to end things for sure absolutely Ooh. I get having the problem with, um, well, not a problem, but it's just one of the things. It's tricky. Like, you have to have important conversations in relationships, right? Address things, talk about it. But it is, it is hard to bring up because you don't want to make things go sideways or um, start a resentment or start making people defensive. But, boy, you got to got to bring things up and talk about it if something's bothering you or whatnot. Whew. I don't know exactly how their relationship crumbled like that. It seemed very happy, <laughs> like joyous even, um, for a lot of it. But, wow. Jackson and April had a tumultuous relationship. Well, okay, the first part of that <laughs> was not tumultuous. <laughs> That's what I love about these edits. You don't know, you know? It can seem very joyful in the beginning, and then they hit you with all the realness at the end. Uh, with major obstacles, but they always found their way back to each other. Their friendship grew into a romantic relationship. That's always the best way, isn't it? Friendship to romantic sometimes. I get sometimes it can just be just romantic, but I think some of the strongest relationships are friendship into romantic, uh, leading to a surprise marriage and the birth of their daughter. Wow. After their divorce, hey -o, and some time apart, Jackson and April eventually reconciled and got back together in the end. All right, we're back to joy. We're back to joy. <laughs> okay, all right. Whew. Um, oh, that's a, 
That's a big giveaway right there. That is a big giveaway. Wow. Baby loss. April and Jackson are one of the biggest pairings on Grey's Anatomy. It was worth it in the end, it seems. Yeah, apparently so. Um, yeah, I get how some trauma would force you apart, but clearly they still loved each other, which is great. Uh, Jackson Avery and April Kepner had a relationship timeline that was just as tumultuous and heartbreaking, heartbreaking as Meredith Grey and Derek Shepard's. Uh, introduced in season six, Jackson and April's relationship had one of the best buildups as viewers saw them to start start as a slow burn romance after years of friendship. Although they weren't always at the forefront of the drama, the couple did create many show-stopping moments, ranging from Jackson's wedding objection and their impulsive elopement. <laughs> hey, they saved some money. Uh, what was that article I read? Was it yesterday? Where the average American wedding is twenty grand? Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> elopement sounds pretty good after reading that. $20,000. However, that didn't mean they didn't face any major obstacles. Despite their deep love, the couple initially struggled to find common ground because of their different faiths and beliefs. Jackson and April also struggled with timing, as the pair would have often knowledge, acknowledge their feelings of, for one another just as they were dating someone else. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's very much the uh, see if you can go find better. <laughs> and then they're just like, well, no, I can't. However, after many seasons and several periods of self-reflection, it didn't take long for them to realize they were meant to be together. <clears throat> they became close friends. Friendship continued to grow. It's about 20K in the UK, too. Whoa! Like, whoa! I get it. It's an important day. I get it. It's a very important day. Well, if you stay together, it's an important day. If you get divorced... It's just a regular day. It's it's a day where you wasted twenty grand. Um, but golly, that could be like a house down payment. That could be an, an epic honeymoon for like weeks. <laughs> um, take a romantic turn, leading them to starting a casual relationship, which quickly backfires. Repair their friendship, struggle to repair it, continue fighting their feelings for one another. Classic. Classic. Love turns you down. That's a funny name for an episode. Jackson interrupts April's wedding, and they get married. What? Get Up, Stand Up is one of Jackson and April's best episodes, as it saw the infamous couple make a life-changing decision. Just as April was marrying Matthew, Jackson confessed his love for her and ask for an, how bad do you feel about Matthew right now? That is brutal. Brutal. You're, you literally got your girl stolen away from you <laughs> on your wedding day. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, I feel so bad for Matthew. That'd be brutal. I don't know how you would come back from that. Viewers waited months to see the outcome of this unforgettable cliffhanger. When the show returned in February, the writers didn't disappoint. April and Jackson left the church together. They were at the church. Oh, oh, yikes. I think it's combining uh, the cost of venue staffing and entertainment, cake dress, the wedding itself. Yeah, yeah, it adds up quick. Um, certainly there's ways to make it cheaper, uh, which I am all for. <laughs> but yeah, if you really go out on some of that stuff, and, and certainly some of the uh, venues take it as a chance to price gouge, you know, it's a special day. We'll charge you extra kind of thing. Or like a photographer. Well, it's your wedding. So my rates are up here instead of down here for just a family photo. Um, wow. They left the church together and got married in secret. Whoa. Considering that episode also revealed the uh, hospital just implemented a non-fraternizing policy. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah, I've heard I've heard some things about hospitals, that's for sure. The right certainly not just in shows. I've heard about it from real life accounts. The writers hinted that this wouldn't remain a secret for long. 
adjust to married life and discover that they are expecting a baby. Ooh, there's a shock. Actually, it would have been a good plot twist if it was Matthew's kid. <laughs> that would have been a big curveball. Uh, April comes, Jackson and April comes to term of being parents. Complications arrive. Fatal condition. Ooh, gosh. That's rough. Struggle in the aftermath. Yep. That makes sense. April joins the army. What? Divorce. Yep. Wow. This is this is a great plot line. Keeps your pregnancy a secret from Jackson, but the relationship turns tense. Welcoming their baby. Oh, so they have a second one. Nice. I want the day to be great for me, but it's more about who I marry and making it special for us. As much as I love Bridgerton Regency dramas, those style weddings is too much, too traditional for me, and I won't financially recover. Yes. <laughs> it's like that Joe Exotic quote, I'll never financially recover from this. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, it should, be, it should be a day about who you're marrying. That should be the big part of that. I get it, you know, keeping up appearances and making it special for everyone involved, but at the end of the day, it's you two, right? After all that glitz and glamour goes away, it's all you have left is each other. So you got to make sure that is rock solid. Um, because if you're building up, building up, building up to this one day, oh my gosh, after that, it's going to get real quiet. <laughs> And then you're just in that life. That's kind of the funny part, is that when you think about it, marriage is, it's literally the same as dating. You just have a contract saying that you'll stick together. That's a really weird way to think about it, but that's literally all it is. So if you're not getting along when you're dating, a piece of paper isn't going to change that. Some wedding bands ain't going to change that. Ay, ay, ay. That is a great storyline. I like that. It has ups and downs. It is intrigue. It has some really crazy trauma in it that drives them apart, and then they find their way back after a while. That is lovely. So I'm, I'm not surprised they're one of the top duos of Grey's Anatomy, for sure. I had never heard of them or seen them, which is a shame. They should be more pushed because that is an interesting storyline. And now a word from our sponsor, which is uh, me, of course. Yeah, the um, those, well, Bridgerton, Downton Abbey, that kind of stuff. It is lovely. It is wonderful for weddings and stuff, but that's a completely different lifestyle that I don't know, <laughs> and that's why I watch those shows. Or you know, I enjoy content like that because it's it's a life that I've never lived and probably will never live. So it's interesting. It's you get to see into that lifestyle without actually being in it. Because honestly, a lot of it looks awful. <laughs> the drama, the judging, the family politics, ugh, all of that just seems very draining to me. Just completely draining. Next video on the list is... Uh, Chaylin, Chase and Brooke Lynn. Brooke Space Lynn from General Hospital. Uh, never till now. It's beautiful and I would love to go to one. Yeah, being a guest to one would be great because I'm sure the food is going to be incredible. The drinks are definitely free. <laughs> They're going to be great. I'm sure it would just be stunning to watch. 
I'm not saying I won't do that style, but it doesn't feel realistic to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's very um, Cinderella-esque where you're just... It would be fun to be a part of that party. You know, see all the cir- pomp and circumstance, but paying for it? <laughs> no. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> There's ways to have a fairy tale wedding without actually paying fairy tale prices. And honestly, what it really comes down to is who you're marrying. Because if you really love that person and just being in that ceremony with them is everything to you, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It'll be the best day of your life, for sure. I've made choices that I knew would hurt people. It's never my intention. I don't care. Well, you dished it out, Dad. Where's I'm my hug? Your father will help you. I think I know what people think about me. You're just the run to the court of You're now lucky us. I'll drop our family name and take me home. After years of running away from the family and all this stuff. Hi, Daddy. I'm home. I thought I'd always be alone. So, coupledom isn't for everyone. Michael, some people value their space, you know? Get to do what you want when you want. You say you're one of those people. Isn't it obvious? Not with the way you were just talking about Chase. Can you imagine the two of us at the BTA? Yeah. I can imagine it really easily, actually. I can't do I didn't want him to think that. Thank you. Out of all the prayers I've prayed. Your heaven's answer out of all the hell I've been through. I suggest you leave right now. We'll figure it out together. Thank God you were right there. I never wanted to tap my brakes. I never wanted to settle down. I was always one foot out the door. I never thought about turning round. Never saw myself. Fence dug into the ground. Never tell now. Never till you walked into that bar. Never till we talked over that song. Never till we danced till closing time. Never till you proved me wrong about the kind of love you fall right so here. hard you never hit the ground. Never tell. Great. You're funny. You're beautiful. Never tell now. Hmm. Interesting. So she had family issues as well. Wow. That must be a uh, a go-to plot point <laughs> for a lot of different things. Oh my gosh. Well, it is a a good plot point. It it can affect their entire life, so it makes sense. You can stem, you know, break off many different avenues from there. And it seems like Chase is uh, just what she was looking for. Kind of that rock, you know? Which I suppose we're all looking for. Someone to be there when we're, you know, upset. Somewhere to, someone to be there um, to comfort us, to cheer us on, to, I don't know, just be our... What's a good way to put that? Be our support. As a writer, it's a good base story to branch off different arcs. Absolutely. It seems like it. So. Wow. That's lovely. I have never seen or heard anything about that couple yet. Obviously, I've watched a video uh, yesterday, I believe. So go ahead and check that out if you haven't seen it. Um, on the previous stream. But uh, I'm having trouble finding information about them, which is weird. Uh, They must not be as popular of a duo. That's why I love family dramas from Bridgerton to the Fosters. Yeah, it is. It does seem like a really good story uh, device, I guess you could call it. You can go anywhere with that, I suppose. 
whether it's trying to reconnect with the family or finding refuge in a different person or different people. Maybe you go a friend's direction. Maybe you go a relationship direction. You were trying to figure out their backstory yesterday. A good summary of Brooklyn and Chase's relationship is in the comments of your YouTube upload of yesterday's stream. All right, let me look. Let me pull that up. Yeah, I remember <laughs> I remember searching for one and I just was coming up empty. All right, let me pull this up here. Uh do, 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 do. let's see if I can find it. Oh, here we go. Let me pull this up. There we go. I can't believe you stumbled upon the nonsense discourse surrounding their lack of soap, soap level happy fun time scenes. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Wiki summary stinks, so here's the rundown. Brooklyn Quartermain, Quartermain, excuse me, Quartermain, is the granddaughter of Tracy Quartermain and the only living great-granddaughter of Edward and Lila Quartermain. Michael is her cousin, but in the Q family, originally a nuclear family of four with one son, Alan, and one daughter, Tracy. Alan's branch is seen as the golden branch, while Tracy has always been the black sheep of the family. Brooke Lynn follows in her grandmother's footsteps and has had a bit of history scheming. Her early relationships on the show were mired with betrayal and toxicity, lies, and manipulation. That changed with Detective Harrison Chase. They met in a series of arrests where she kept accidentally assaulting him. <laughs> That's funny. Bridgerton is good to explore how a family navigates society together compared to Umbrella Academy, where a different group of siblings try to coexist as the world crumbles. That is an yeah, that is a good take on that. And it's such it's a totally different society than most of us are used to. It's like a very high society. Yeah, Umbrella Academy is very much like different people coming together, just trying to figure out how to move on basically or deal with their issues um she kept accidentally assaulting him <laughs> but eventually he started to see a different side of her chase was historically very by the book and rigid blq that's a amazing acronym there was the polar opposite always playing in the gray uh their pairing strikes a nice balance with chase encouraging blq to be more open and vulnerable and to try to do the right thing. And conversely, BLQ helps Chase be more forgiving and less self-righteous. They started out as friends. I mean, one thing my dad always said about my mom is, you know, I think I, I can't remember who asked him, whether it was me or my brother, but I can't remember. But somebody said, <laughs> how did you know she was the one? And uh, my dad said, well, I married my best friend. He goes, as long as you, as long as you do that, you'll always have a friend for life. And as long as there's love there, it's just, it's a never ending friendship, connection, love. It's just a perfect blend. And I was like, huh, solid advice. They started out as friends because at the start of their friendship, Chase was head over heels in love with Willow, but she eventually fell in love with Michael, BLQ's cousin. Wow. And you've seen their love story in other videos, Milo. Oh, oh my gosh. I had completely forgotten about that. BLQ was there for Chase as he grieved that breakup, and Chase was there for BLQ as she tried to navigate her tense relationship with her family, particularly her dad, as we did see in that video. Nelly? Nell? Attacked BLQ by... Uh, how do I say that on YouTube? By um, trying to remove her head. <laughs> I don't know if that's any better. At the nurse's ball. <laughs> that's why BLQ was relieved when she uh, died. 
In the wake of the attack, Chase helped BLQ get her life back on track. Boy, that is wild. And helped her grieve the loss of her singing voice. Oh, no. Which was the one thing she was ne- she was never able to... Wait. She was ever able to bond with her dad about? Oh, gosh. Eventually, their friendship turned into something... That is really brutal for a soap opera, soap drama. <laughs> like, that is a brutal storyline. Wow. I'm actually kind of shocked by that. I thought... Uh, I thought all the drama and soap operas and soap dramas was very, you know, G-rated or PG at least. I did not know it was that wild. Eventually their friendship turned into something more when BLQ hatched a scheme with her best friend, Maxie. Maxie was in a toxic relationship with a psychopath (laughs) and needed to hide her daughter uh, from her father, Peter. She tried to Henry the Aether. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Oh, my gosh. That's wild. BOQ faked a pregnancy and passed Maxie and Peter's baby off as her own to hide her in plain sight. Wow. Originally, the plan was to say that the father was Valentine uh, Cassidine, Spencer's cousin. But when that plan fell through, Chase stepped up and lied, saying that he was the father. BLQ and Chase then raised Maxie's baby as their own for months, living in the same house and getting closer and closer. In the end, Peter was murdered, and Chaelin had to give the baby back to her mom. That was always the plan, but BLQ and Chase grieved the loss of their fake daughter. (laughs) What is happening? What is happening? This is unbelievable. If I was just reading this completely out of context without realizing that it was actual, actually part of a show, I would just think this was somebody's wild imagination going wild. <laughs> like, what? What? Oh, my gosh. Through some additional ups and downs, plus a ridiculously drawn-out storyline involving BLQ's ex-music producer, who sexually... Who... Um, pursued in a negative way, <laughs> her, her uh, Chase and Brooklyn finally ended up together. I'd be like, oh, Reddit's gone insane. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now they're engaged to be married. Hey! Happy for him. Good stuff. Uh, but the newest drama in their storylines surround Chase's father, Chase's father's health, since he was recently diagnosed with ALS. Well, as far as the drama goes, that's the that's the least dramatic thing that's happened to them, probably. Considering everything else I just read. That is normal, honestly. Wow. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yes, Reddit has gone insane again. That was... I am just stunned. That is a great rundown. Thanks for bringing that up, uh, Morgan. I appreciate it. Wow. I got to say, I am shocked at uh, the storylines of soap soap opera, soap dramas. I did not realize they went this hard. (laughs) No wonder they're still around and been running on for like 60, 70 years. It makes sense. It makes a lot of sense because that is... Hmm. I mean, that is basically a novel turned into a TV show. Like, that does not hold punches, does not hold back. Wow. Well, you got to keep it interesting, right? All these different couples, all these different years, all these different characters. You got to build an interesting story arc for each of them. And that is just unbelievable. You got to keep coming, people coming back, right? And if you're pulling all that, like, and more, uh, that is a great way to have people coming back. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Wow. That makes me wonder about other storylines in that show. Just how, just how hard do they go as well? Because if this is just normal, General Hospital might be one of the most unbelievable shows I've ever heard of. <laughs> oh my god. 
gosh. Oh, wow. I am shook. I am so shook at that. That's crazy. That is a great relationship. The amount of times I've seen the odd episodes since I don't watch soaps where a character is blown up or buried alive, and I'm like, is this the same show? <laughs> That's unbelievable. Now I get it. I fully understand it. Why you would be watching these shows just consistently year after year. If it's that wild, people getting blown up, buried alive, you know, bit of that. Raising a fake baby, your fake baby. That is just. (laughs) Oh, and the family drama too. The family drama. I guess this is a very extreme Bridgerton, right? A very extreme Bridgerton set in more of a modern, normal kind of experience. Um, Obviously, you have some royals in there, but I'm assuming not everyone's a royal. Wow. That is a more interesting couple than I originally thought. That is great to hear. (laughs) That is great to hear. Oh, my gosh. It's unbelievable. Next video, the last video of the day is a leverage video. What is the title of this? Uh, Call it, wait, call it what you call what you want. Elliot Parker Hardison. I'd expect all this in like Arrow or Umbrella Academy since all the above happened many times, but a soap opera blows my mind. Yeah, exactly. I was reading that and I'm just like, wait, this is what, this is what people are watching in soap operas. Like this is totally different than what I assumed. I guess it kind of makes sense. Soap operas are very much like, uh, you know, plays in a way and plays can be pretty brutal. But yeah, I was not, because this is daytime television. Like, this is like after Wheel of Fortune or something. (laughs) That's unbelievable. I did not expect that. I love that. (laughs) All right, let's hop into this last video, Leverage. I remember seeing ads for this show all the time, but I just never looked into it. Is that Taylor Swift? All the liars are calling me one. Nobody's heard from me for months. I'm doing better. Then again, some soaps in the UK in the e- is in the evening after our news show about 7 p.m. Oh, okay. I think all of the soap operas, soap dramas in the U.S. are like 11 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> like noon, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. I don't think any of them are prime time. I'm trying to think. I don't think I remember seeing any like past like 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. Than I ever was. Cause my baby's fit like a daydream walking with his head down. I'm the one he's walking to. Sorry, I'm sparking up my 
Love to be a spy, but rather not fall to my death or be shot or blown up, so I'll pass. <laughs> I'll be the behind the scenes. Yeah, I'll be the person at the computer, like checking the security cameras or something. I have no idea how to do any of that, but I'd rather be that. <laughs> to... I'll be the tech guy in the background. <laughs> oh my gosh. That was uh obviously it's a music video, there's no actual dialogue involved. Um, but clearly that was showing a lot of different scenes where they had to dress up in disguises. Um, let me see if I can pull this up to better illustrate this point. So, all right, so it's a team of cons, small team of cons, who are hired to recover a set of stolen aviation plans for aerospace... Wait, is this just the first, like, episode? Uh, let's see. Con results in a life-altering payout for each member of the team and the discovery that each develops a taste for using their skills to do good. That's kind of interesting. That's the flip of uh, once you were bad, now you're doing, you know, Good things. <laughs> Although, kind of reminds me of Dexter. I think I said that last time. Where you're still doing bad, but you're doing it for good-ish reasons, like moral gray zone stuff. With Ford as their reluctant leader, they set up a business as Leverage Consulting and Associates, first in L.A. and later in Boston, helping ordinary people who have fallen victim to fraud, theft, cons, and other misdeeds by corporate America. Using their skills, they turn the tables on the mark, staging elaborate cons that bring the mark to justice. Part of me also thinks, wait, isn't that entrapment? <laughs> but then again, if they're not part of the law, I guess that is fine. They're just regular people at that point trying to get you in a situation where you break the law or you know, do something shady that can be used against you. I don't know about that. I guess because they're not law enforcement, it's okay. Former insurance investigator who at one time chased each member of the team, plagued by the demons of his past, divorced from art expert. Opportunity to lead a team of cons on a mission to retrieve stolen blueprints leads to the financial score of a lifetime. He finds himself using his skills to help ordinary people who fall victim of corporate greed and wrongdoing. Brings in a grifter. A gift for characters and accents. <laughs> Relationship remains a complicated one. Retrieval expert. 
distaste for guns, protecting the team from physical threats, adapt in hand-to-hand combat, expert thief. Aha, here we go, Hardison. If it can be hacked, Hardison can hack it. (laughs) There we go, there's the job. There's the good job right there. Not too into the action, you know, kind of in the background, you know, using your technological skills to get some money (laughs) instead of being in direct harm's way. Well-known in the hacker community. Set up nearly any technological scenario the team may need. Yeah, this very much reminds me of Ocean's 12 or Ocean's 11, Ocean's 13, Ocean's 8, all the oceans. Yeah, I'm Hardison. Yep. (laughs) Right. I am very much relating to Hardison, for sure. That is the perfect amount of that I want to be in. Grifter friend. Personal discovery. Grifts for money. Nate's ex-wife. Art appraiser? Okay. All right. That's a nice one, too. Just kind of stay in the background. Gifted hacker. Yeah. I would much rather be on the outskirts. I can't hack, but I'll learn to. (laughs) Because otherwise I'm dead. Yes. Same. Very much same. This sounds like an interesting show. It does. But it definitely reminds me of Ocean's Eleven. Um, where you get a team together instead of doing bank heists, you're, you know, doing a better thing, I guess you're trying to right wrongs, bring people to justice that, you know, wronged people. Although I will say I would much rather watch, uh, oceans 11 with that cast. I mean, come on now. (laughs) That was an unbelievable cast. I can't even imagine how much that movie cost. Actually, that's a good question. How much did that movie cost? (laughs) Let me look that up real quick. I'm sure, because each person was definitely established by then, for sure. 2001, maybe it was, you know, not as much as I, oh, oh, okay. So it earned $450 million at the box office, which is pretty good for, you know, a remake of the original. The original was in 1960. Let me look up, uh, let's see. Where's the Wikipedia? There we go. Let's see. First installment in the trilogy budget 85 mil and it made 450 i mean based on the star power it's hard not to george clooney matt damon brad pitt andy garcia casey affleck bernie mack carl reiner julia roberts i mean good grief domestic box office 183 267 International. I'm sure it made a lot of money in... uh, I'm sure it made a lot of money in video sales as well. Opening weekend was 21% of their overall take-home... Video sales, that's got to be huge, right? Oh, it's got no information on it. Oh, come on. I knew it was going to be huge. Because in 2001, people were still adamantly buying physical media. Oh, yeah, it beat projections like crazy. Holy crap. That was probably word of mouth. People were like going to see it initially, and then more people talked about it, and then it just went up. Yeah, shaded area represents the expected performance. 
and it just completely beat that. Yeah, its first weekend was like thirty-eight million. Yeah, I mean, with the names, I'm sh- I can't remember the trailer for it, but I'm sure the trailer was just people were blown away by the names in it. <laughs> like, whoa! All right, I'll go check that out. Seems like a really good show. This is more of like a TV version of it, I guess, in a way. And we do love a good, you know, taking on corporate greed, uh, righting wrongs, going after people that are harming people financially or, you know, some sort of insurance fraud or scam. I don't know if you've ever seen, there's a show called, um, oh, what is it called? American Greed. And it's on CNBC, the television station. And it is fantastic. It's usually revolving around medical scams, like medical fraud or insurance fraud, something like that. Um, You know, people come in, they pay for a service or a procedure, and then they like cut corners crazy, like they leave instruments within the patient, or they do like... I saw one where this doctor cut open this person to do the procedure and then just stitched it right back up. Didn't do anything. Did not do a thing. And then just bailed. (laughs) Like did that to hundreds of people, made a ton of money off of it, and then bailed, tried to go to a different country, and eventually it was chased down. But unbelievable. There are some crazy, I guess you could say evil, if you want, bad people out there. So definitely be careful. <laughs> that that show is very um, nihilistic. It makes you think pretty negatively about people. So you don't you don't want to binge it or watch it too much of it. I was born two years after it, so I didn't uh, didn't see the trailer for Ocean's Eleven. I've seen the film though. It was a good film. It was a good film. My favorite part is the fact that Brad Pitt is always eating in every scene that he's in. That was so weird. Like, what was the point of that? Why? (laughs) Like he picks George Clooney up from uh, jail and he's just eating nachos, like leaning up against his car. Like, where'd he get the nachos? Why is he eating the nachos? (laughs) Such a good show. But yeah, American Greed, crazy. So yes, I think... uh, I like the premise. I like it. And the fact that they're not directly involved in law enforcement makes it kind of interesting because it's almost like vigilante justice, which is always fun to see. Not in real life, but, you know, written. (laughs) All right. That is the last video of the day. Today is technically the channel's Friday, I guess you could say. So I will see you all on Monday for the next reaction stream. We are catching up fast, very fast. Um, this was definitely a good move in that in that regard. Toddreacts.com for the merch. Check it out. Web- website, me- whoa, let me get my words right. Website members save 15% off every order. Um, be sure to follow the Twitch channel if you want to watch live. Eventually, it will be coming over to YouTube. So watch it here first. And then eventually you'll have to, you know, stay on YouTube or you can continue watching on Twitch, whichever one. Um, The VODs are always uploaded to YouTube after Twitch. It takes a little while for it to process, but it will be up same day. Um, Usually around, I don't know, 2 p.m. Central or 3 p.m. Central. Depends. And uh, yeah, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Like the video if you like it. Uh, Throw on the notifications. That way you know when they actually post uh, immediately. Hopefully that works. I'm not sure if the notifications work on YouTube, honestly. It seems like the Twitch notifications are a little bit more with it, oddly enough. But yeah. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Luke, good to see you. And uh, I shall see you all on Monday. There will be a gaming stream on Saturday on Twitch. So if you want to check it out, come on over. Come hang out. It's very chill. We're just hanging out, playing video games. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a great rest of your day, weekend, if I'll see you on Monday. And uh, yeah, take care. Bye-bye.